quarter events that we've got going on this semester um, through the college website event calendar and also check out the Bristol Buzz. Um, most of you have evaluations. I will be collecting them at the end. There's some on the stairs. Please be careful and not to trip over them. We're, we're running low on those. Um, we really rely heavily on those uh, evaluations. It helps us determine what events um, that you want to um, see and hear. One important announcement is that if you need to leave this auditorium, to be as quiet as possible as to not to disturb the audience or the speaker. Okay, I would now like to introduce to you Whitney Taylor. Whitney is the field director of the American Civil Liberties Union in Massachusetts. Ta Ms. Taylor will speak about discriminatory practices and government policies that have been harmed communities in the country's efforts to eliminate drugs. She is a leader in efforts to reform our nation's drug laws and was the director of the 2010 ballot campaign which decriminalized marijuana in Massachusetts. <coughs> Please give a warm BCC welcome to Whitney Taylor. Thanks, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Yes. So a few little ground rules. Hopefully you can hear me. <laughs> then I'm really bad. Um, just a few things so everybody knows. Um, we're going to be talking about some issues and about history. And so I don't mean to offend anybody, but I am going to be saying some things as they were printed back in the day. Um, so I don't mean to offend anybody. Um, that's just kind of how it rolls. Also, we're going to be talking about drug policy issues. And the focus of my talk is going to be about government programs and drug policy issues and how we've dealt with the issue of illicit drug policy. But just so folks know, a ground rule here, there are many people who have problems with substance abuse and, um, and have addiction issues. And this is, the, none of part of this talk is to be belittling them. Actually, the whole theme of this is that our criminal justice approach to this issue should be a public health approach um, and other types of approaches. So I just want to tell folks that as well. Because um, I know people kind of, especially if you've had uh, friends, family, loved ones that have, have dealt with an addiction issue. I know how emotional it is. I've had it in my family as well. Um, and I don't by any means mean to be rude about that. What we're talking about is government policies and what's going on there. Finally, um, this, what I'm going to be talking about today, I've actually taught an entire semester on this subject. So it is a humongous subject. So um, what I would rather do is if, if as I'm talking you have questions, ask questions as I'm talking because there's many different kinds of detours that we can take and you know, I'll take them by myself but I would rather take the detours that you guys actually want to talk about. Um, so, so feel free at any time, raise your hand and we can, and we can talk about those issues. Um, and that way also we're not sitting there at the end going, oh, nobody has questions, we have this time left over and I'll do a tap dance, you don't want to see that. Um, so, again, my name is Whitney Taylor. I work with the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. How many people here knows what the ACLU is and what we do? Damn it. Obviously, we don't get our mission out very well. Um, and that's something, one of the reasons I was actually brought on to the ACLU a couple of years ago. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union is a, na is a national organization that has 50 affiliates, in so one in every state, as well as an affiliate in Washington, D.C., and a Puerto Rico affiliate. The mission of the ACLU is to defend and protect the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and here in Massachusetts, our Mas Massachusetts De Declaration of Rights, which is our state-based uh, rights. And, um, a lot of these things, when I say the Bill of Rights, do, do folks kind of know what I'm talking about? First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. Second Amendment, the right to create militias. Um, Third Amendment gets into some, some detailed stuff. Fourth Amendment, search and seizure. You should be secure in your house. Nodding heads, do we kind of understand what the Bill of Rights is? Because I can also teach a whole course on that, but I don't want to right now, because this is fun stuff. Because I'm sure you're all here because, yay, drugs is in the title, right? Um, <laughs> I know, come on. <laughs> and that's OK, because I'll teach you stuff. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today, and what I've kind of said, the, oh, and then the last thing I wanted to share, I really apologize. When I taught this class last night, there were 20 people here. So I went to Attleboro to teach this class this morning with 100 copies of my handout, thinking, oh, plenty. 
110 people showed up there. So I put some copies out there and um, more copies are going to be on their way and being made. So I apologize, um, but I think this is a champagne problem as far as I'm concerned that there's too many people coming to the talk. Um, and um, I will point things out. And if I'm talking about something, again, raise your hand and ask a question. Uh, but so the title of this talk, or you know, kind of the concept of this, is the war on drugs is a war on race and a war on civil liberties. Um, the war on drugs and our drug policies, as they started being created, uh, starting in the late 1800s, is about control. None of our drug laws or our drug policies really emanate from a place of wanting to deal with the issue of illicit drugs or the problems that drugs can cause in society. What is it, it has been about is control of populations. Control of populations of people based on race, based, based on culture, um, based on socioeconomic status. And how I start this, you know, to, to, to start this of how we actually came to, ha to having a war on drugs. In the 1800s in the United States, have, have, you, any of you, have you guys uh, familiar with the term of a snake oil salesman? You know, folks that used to go around in their wagons and say, take this elixir, it will make your baby sleep, it will help you with your cough. If you have a woman in your life that has the vapors, it'll fix all ills. Um, well, of course it fixed all ills because most of those elixirs either had cocaine, heroin, or morphine in them, and or opium. And sure, you feel great after taking a you know, cherry-flavored douse of, of opium, even if you still have a cough, you don't care. Your baby's certainly not crying anymore. They're having a nice nap. Um, and so this was the use of drugs. Actually, in the 1800s and early 1900s, you could order such elixirs from the Sears Roebuck catalog. Ooh, send me a case, cherry flavored opium, awesome. You know, send it off. And, and that, and that would, was how drugs um, were being used at this point because there wasn't this arbitrary legal illegal status of these substances. Um, And as this was going on, the first kind of laws that we started to see happening were not so much federal laws, but they were state-based laws based on issues of taxation. Well, if these snake oil salesmen are out there selling these, these things, we should tax it and make some money off of it. Um, maybe we should control this. Then they were figuring out, wow, these people were selling these elixirs with folks not knowing what was in it. So let's pass a law that makes sure that all of the ingredients are listed on the bottle. Um, let's make sure that doctors have the ability to prescribe certain types of these medications and elixirs. Um, it even got to the point of, you know, Coca-Cola did have cocaine in it when it first started. And it'd be like, okay, people are loving this Coca-Cola, let's make sure they know what's inside of it and, and what they're taking and why they feel so great after they have a Coke. Um, and, so, and so this was kind of how drug use was happening in this country. Um, it wasn't until the late 1800s that we started seeing the first types of drug laws. And what these drug laws were about, once again, it was not about the drugs. It was about control of certain populations. And very honestly, it was a big part of uh, the labor movement. And white union labor leaders not wanting certain populations of workers to be able to come into communities and work. They needed a way to control certain populations. So the first drug law ever on the book, books was a law in 1975 in San Francisco. At that time in San Francisco, the, the gold rush had, had been going on. They were building the railroads, and there were lots of Chinese, Chinese people in San Francisco. Chinese people were using opium, just like, just like whites and other populations in San Francisco. The difference being Chinese, people from the Chinese culture smoked their opium. So it was a little bit different. And when you smoke that opium, opium dens happened, where people would go and smoke this opium. And so what we saw happening was the Chinese laborers would come in and would want to do this work. And we had white union laborers going, we don't want people, these people taking our jobs. Sound familiar? Um, so what, we want, what we're going to do is pass a law, and they actually passed a law in San Francisco in 1875 that said Chinese people cannot smoke opium. White people could. Other people could. 
people could use drugs in another way, but the law was specifically Chinese people cannot smoke opium. So then you could very easily go into these opium dens, round up all these people, all these workers who, you know, and, and by that time, of course, there's always people in history that have problems with addiction, but the vast majority of people just like going home on a Friday and having a beer or a glass of wine, or you know, I may say you know, at the end of the day on the weekend, maybe smoking a little marijuana, people can have pos pos positive relationships with drugs. And there were people, many folks in this culture that used opium just like we use beer. But what happened was we made it illegal and then there was places where law enforcement could go in and arrest these people and take them out of the community. Um, that lasted for a couple years and then people figured out, wow, this is really racist. Um, it's kind of on its face racist, so let's figure out, out another way to do this. So then they made actually a statewide law that people couldn't smoke opium and that made everybody feel better. Um, even though it was still smoking and going after a certain class of people because they used the drug in that manner. Um, during this time, again, more laws and, and oh, I'm so sorry, there will be more handouts, but um, you'll see I have this kind of this history of laws that were done from 1937. So up until 1937 and then and through the president, up until 1937, we were still operating under this, well, drugs are legal, let's just make sure we kind of regulate it and let's tax it and let's make sure people know what they're taking. <coughs> but it wasn't kind of our zero tolerance drug war that we were, we were doing. Well, we then, in the 19, uh, early 1900s, 1920s, <coughs> we were in a process in our country of moving, of you know, industrial revolution expansion, of more people migrating to work in factories, and um, people coming out of the country. And what was this for white labor leaders, but an increase of workers coming into cities to work in factories, and white union laborers wanted to keep those jobs for white union members. So, in the, night, in, in the teens and 20s, um, there came a new PR campaign um, about a certain class of workers, the um, African Americans coming from the South, although that's not what it was called. This is an article from the New York Times in February 1914. Um, you will see a copy, but the most important is I'll read the headline. The head, and this was, a, this was an op-ed written by the guy who basically at the time was like our Surgeon General. Um, so big national leader. And the headline in the New York Times is, Negro cocaine fiends are a new southern menace. Murder and insanity increasing among lower class blacks because they have taken to sniffing since deprived of whiskey by prohibition. This article then goes to talk about how um, especially black men would become impervious to bullets. So when they were high on the drug and you could shoot them and they wouldn't stop. And that the reason blacks were taking this, this uh, medication is because they wanted to take the white women. Now let me tell you through the history when I'm talking about these PR campaigns, I'm pretty amazed that white women exist today because boy are we stupid according to all these people. Everybody had to protect us from the beginning. I'm lucky I got dressed this morning according to some of these people. But this was the big scourge. You know, the southern blacks coming up to the north into other industrialized countries to, to take jobs. So this was a PR campaign. There's nothing based in truth, but this is what the gospel was going around the country from the federal government. Um, and as this is going on, we then come to the 1930s. So all of these um, types of PR campaigns are continuing. Remember, news m moved much slower then. People actually depended just on newspapers um, and that type of issue. So you know, we think about PR campaigns today when you know, a good life cycle for a PR campaign is six months. Um, today with all the ways we communicate, but back then, 10 years on a PR campaign was nothing because it took long for everybody to talk about it. But then we, then we come up to the, to the 1930s. <coughs> and once again, we're now finding a balance in our country with the agriculture and the industry. But many people have left agriculture to go work in industry, but we still need the agriculture. So we are starting to be an influx of, of Mexican pe people from Mexico coming here to work in fields. And imagine this, white labor leaders said, wait a minute, they're taking all of our jobs. And we then began the wonderful age of reefer madness. Um, so I don't know if you guys have uh, remember reefer madness. Um, it's actually a movie. These are some of my favorites. So right here, it's the sweet pill that makes life better, bitter. Sorry. Women cry for it, men die for it. 
and um, sin, vice, and insanity, drug-crazed abandon. You know, really good PR. But while this was going on, what they were saying is this evil, the evil weed was coming from Mexico. And it was actually the Mexican population that was bringing this scourge onto the people, the good people of the US who never wanted to alter their consciousness and never wanted to take drugs. And it was all their fault and they're here to make everybody high and to go after the white women. I mean, this, I mean, it's amazing. Um, and so, this, and so, so, so much of our drug laws during this period of time, what we were seeing in the drug war, it truly was a propaganda campaign to control certain cultures and races of people. I mean, that's what it was about. It certainly was not about the drugs since white people were still using these drugs in many different ways. And even with, and even with the PR, the first time you actually saw PR was on white people was the reefer madness, but that's because our young children and our women can't do anything and can't make up their own mind and it's evil Mexicans coming in and, and making them do these drugs. It wasn't until 1970 with Richard Nixon that we actually had the official announcement of the war on drugs. And in 1970, Nixon worked on the, the passage of, see it is that, the Comp Comprehensive Drug Abuse and, and uh, Control Act. So in 1970, they, we basically said as a country, forget all those other laws about taxing, about health, about ingredients, about doctors being able to prescribe. We now are gonna make everything illegal and use the criminal justice system to enforce this because we're gonna have a drug-free America. Now, just to step back a little bit, looking at who we are as a country and what drugs really are and how they really interact with us as a society, as I'm sure you all know, this country was built on tobacco and alcohol. But if you actually look at the physiological effects of drugs, the two most harmful drugs to people are tobacco and alcohol. But we, but the white power structure that was their drugs, what they made money on, what we built this country on, and it wasn't going to be taken away. Now, we did have that wonderful little dalliance with prohibition, but I've never seen the Constitution be changed so quickly one way and back. Uh, very soon people said, wait a minute, what? We can't drink? This is ridiculous. And, and, but once again, that was because it was the drug of the power structure. Um, now, this is not to say, once again, just so everybody knows, when I talk about the physiological harms of drugs, when you have a black market and drugs are being sold illegally, there is no control over the drug. So we know exactly what the alcohol content is in every beer. We know exactly how much tobacco is in every cigarette because it has to be listed because they are controlled substances. A lot of the problems that we see people have with drugs if there's a, 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 the drug is going bad, it's because of what the drug is cut with or because it's in the black market. And those are very often more the, the problems, the actual physical problems of the drug. When you actually are talking about, uh, say, uh, withdrawal, um, while, for example, withdrawal from a heroin is really horrible and it's a really awful f flu type feeling, sickness, um, there's also a lot of mental issues with that. Only uh, alcohol is the only drug that you can physically, you can die from the physical effects of withdrawing from alcohol, just to put it in perspective of how these drugs are. Um, so you know, that's why during this whole period of time when we're talking about this drug war, alcohol and tobacco have had a lovely little run, except I said that little period of prohibition where honestly, most people still use drugs. I mean, you still use alcohol. It was just under a black market. They were drinking bathtub gin once again in the black market. That's what caused blindness. That's what caused death because smuggling big barrels of beer and wine was harder to do. So people switched to harder liquor that could be made in a bathtub and you didn't have to, and it was easier to deal in an illegal system. Um, also want to make sure it's not that this that I'm teaching is pro-drug. That's why I keep doing these disclaimers because I've had people have questions and, and but I'm just kind of stating what, I, what I'm trying to give you is this, the situation of where we were to create these policies and how these policies really were, had nothing to do with drugs and everything to do with social control. So in 1970, when Richard Nixon came in and he passed this, this law, you know, he's gonna announce the war on drugs. This is the same period of time where he is trying to win his second term in office. He's not a very popular, well, he's a kind of popular guy, but he didn't have a war to win. And this is also when television was starting. Um, you know, before, you know, people just would listen to the words of a president or read the words of a president. We now got to see this kind of scunchy, old, sweaty man. And people would go, ooh, that's the president? 
Um, and so he had a lot of barriers to what he, when he was running his campaign, reapplying for his job. So he said, I need a hook. I need to figure out what to do. What can I rally the majority of voters, still at this time, white people, what can I do to rally them behind me and get me the presidency? And so he went out and he was thinking about, once again, this, this paradigm that started being created with drugs, the us and them. And a lot of this stuff is, is being fear, fear based of the them. And the them being, depending on what you're talking about, the black community, the Chinese community, the Mexican community, the Asian, you know, the, you name the community. Um, you know, most people, you know, white skinned folks, they still all stuck together. I mean, it's the way racism and also institutionalized learning of a country growing and people understanding different cultures and races happens. So he goes up and he started to figure out what can I do what, uh, about this? And he did, he did start seeing that when you started talking about drug users, that type of them, that you could get folks scared about drugs. And what better to do than protect people, especially white women, from drugs than to start fighting this war. Um, but, you know, one of Nixon's downfalls being that he wrote down everything or tape recorded everything. Uh, we've kind of now found out kind of, you know, we always, I've been working this field for 20 something years and it was kind of like, this is what's going on. I wish, you know, we wish we had this. Well, we've actually now, there's been a bunch of scholars that have written about Nixon and written about this period of time to find out how blunt he was about this. Um, so this is one of his, his deputies writing in a journal saying, President Nixon emphasized that you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to. So he, he did at least realize you can't run a presidential campaign saying we hate the blacks. But he did say, I'm going to do a war on drugs. And what drugs are we going to do a war on? These drugs that we see in our urban centers and in our cities and, who, and people that we can police are them. Um, in fact, uh, there was uh, 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 Ike Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower was a huge mentor of Nixon's. And uh, a, a scholar has recently found out in looking in, in um, a lot of correspondence that Nixon actually wrote to Eisenhower, I think this drug war thing is really going to work. People get really scared of the drug users. And I'm up in New Hampshire. There's not even any blacks here. And it's still working. So this is how blunt this was about the drug war being a, 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 a war on race and who we are in this country and the divis divisiveness in this. Nixon was the one that was the architect, started building this stuff. So under Richard Nixon, he created the Drug Enforcement Administration. So you now have a huge governmental body that's going to drive this drug war. We're going to be in charge of this war. We've got generals. We've got this. Even better, he um, appointed the first drug czar. Now, I don't know if you all know because in recent years, while our policies have not been changing that much, they've at least gotten better at PR. Uh, we now have a director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Eight years ago, it was still a drug czar. And so he, he got the drug czar out there, a general for his war, a czar, no less. Um, uh, Nixon uh, also, uh, <laughs> I love this part. So he created the DEA. He gave the DEA a czar. They're all excited to go and do this. And so he says, I'm going to prove that this war is worth something. I want a study done. So the first national study ever on the issue of uh, drug abuse and what drug abuse does, what use does, and all these things. So he does this big study. Every yay, we can't wait to see this study because the study is going to prove that our drug war is going to work and we're going to save America and save the white women, save the children. Um, and what's funny is this first report came out and did have some issues about different types of drugs, but their first recommendation was to decriminalize marijuana. And Nixon's like, ooh, that's not what we wanted. So, <laughs> so the whole report kind of got trashed and said, well, yeah, that was just a report. And the drug war continued. Um, and, and Nixon rode this. And then, as we all know, he had other political problems. Believe it or not, the drug war was his most popular thing which now kind of makes me vomit a little. But 
that's that's what we had. And so now we're moving into the next era. Um, and the other thing that, uh, and especially about the, the marijuana piece, sorry, I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about this, is once again, during this time, during the Vietnam War, during the 60s and all that stuff, the counterculture, people that were coming out against the war, coming out the way the government was working, were associated with marijuana use. Now, the reality is that there were way more people that were against the war and, and wanted our government to do other things than, they, than were smoking marijuana. But it's fun. I mean, this, once again, this is a PR campaign. You get the picture of the people smoking pot and, and being hippies, not taking care of things, and, and we can wage this type of war. So, so the, the war on marijuana, even after the study saying, you know, we should decriminalize, got escalated because here was another population of people that wanted to be controlled. And you could control them, you could identify them because of the movement that they were involved with and, because of, and then you had legal ramifications because of the illegality of, of um, marijuana. Any questions? Really? I'm that awesome. All right. The evaluations better say so. Um, <laughs> So then we start, and then we move, so, so we move happily, and then the 1980s happen, and we get Ronald Reagan. And Reagan and his wife Nancy really kicked it up a notch. They were awesome. Just say no, yeah. Have any, all of you heard of the Just Say No campaign? Yeah, yeah. Yes, this is funny. I was in high school one day. Yeah, so was I. And they were on the shopping bags. They, they were in the shopping bags. It just said Just Say No all over it. So they created this Just Say No, and the other thing that they did, that's me. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to know what time it was. Um, with the Just Say No campaign, they also came up with the concept of zero tolerance. And what, the, what this did to us in this country was not only take this us and them situation, those bad people, those drug users, and we're now building it that we see our policing does happen mostly in communities of color, that when people are, are um, caught with drugs, if you were poor and you didn't have access to a good lawyer, that was who was going to prison, which is, which is something that's continued to escalate through today. But now we're sitting here going, okay, zero tolerance. If you're caught using drugs once, you're out. We're gonna kick you out of school, we're gonna kick you out of clubs, we're gonna kick you out of our community, we're just gonna kick you out. And especially in the school piece, you have a young person that might be experimenting with drugs, so the perfect idea is to kick them out of school so they're home alone with lots of time to do what? Yes, more drugs. Um, and in fact, what should happen in these situations and what we have seen as the backlash of zero tolerance is there's still a lot of schools and there's still a lot of places that, that um, practice zero tolerance, but we're now finally seeing a kind of a swing of the pendulum back and going, you know what would really help if, some, if a kid is using drugs, let's keep them in school, let's keep them in activities, let's keep them busy, let's keep them involved mm -hmm. versus kicking them out and, and not allowing them to get an education or whatever. Now there is a reality, as I said, this isn't a pro-drug speech. Uh, young people's brains you know, are, are very active and growing in the teenage years. And so there is, there is actually science behind why you know, the decisions are being made that young people shouldn't use drugs. But then we get to a point after people have kind of matured and their brain has matured that we just randomly make up numbers in my opinion. 18 years old, you could, they'll hand you a gun and you can go kill people. But you can't have a beer? Like just, per, you know, I just think that that's crazy. If you can go to war and you can be a soldier at 18, what's the magical number of 21 for alcohol? Now, if there's science to it or whatever, that's great. And also for voting, you know, deciding the, the future of our country. If we really don't trust 18 year olds with alcohol, why are we trusting them with guns and ballots? You know, so it's, once again, these kind of numbers that are out there. Because I do believe there is, there is the science behind the fact of the developmental brain, but then there's a point where it's like, okay, we're just trying to control people for their entire lives based on the, their, their drug of choice or their, you know, uh, of what they use. And once again, just discerning that from people who have positive relationships with drugs, any drug, or anything as a matter of fact. You know, I have a horrible relationship with Twinkies, but I'm not getting arrested every time I go to the bakery. And, and, and Twinkies can cause diabetes. There's all these, phys I mean, uh, you know, overweight is heart problems. There's all these things that can happen to me. So if you just take out the issue of drug that has all these things around it, wouldn't we be policing my Twinkie intake? 
because of the physical aspects and not how I could leave my family and I could be a cost burden on the system because of my addiction to Twinkies and my diabetes and my heart problems and all this stuff. Please don't arrest me, I do love Twinkies. But, but that's what I'm trying to say with this is what we do is automatically assume that if somebody chooses a different drug, an other drug than the two drugs we've decided in this country were okay, alcohol and tobacco, all of a sudden you're a them. Um, and what has been helpful is the fact that the two drugs, alcohol and tobacco, were our mainstay. They were our main thing. So they were the majority drug of choice. <laughs> Gotta love lobbyists. Um, wait a minute, I'm a lobbyist. Uh, but anyway, so under Reagan, these not only brought on these, these pests, they really made, it was pageantry. It was amazing. And he would start, he used to have a bunch of his cabinet meetings um, filmed, not the whole cabinet meeting, just parts of it, but the ones that he actually released were like, he would look around the table at everybody and go, so what are you doing on the war on drugs today? Hmm. And he would sit there and listen, this was actually put out there in the populace. And there was not a single federal agency that did not have a drug war line um, item in their budget. Department of, of Agriculture, Parks, transportation, you name it, everybody. Of course, then there's DOJ, and then there's the DEA, which obviously all they did was the war on drugs. Um, but this was really the federal government. This was the war. This is what we were going to do and what we were going to win. Um, and there's a really good book for these things that I was just talking about, and I'm sorry again, but it's called Smoke and Mirrors, The War on Drugs and the Politics of Failure. It's an older book by Dan Baum. It came out in 1996, but since this is about the history part, doesn't matter, it was 1996, he's talking about things that happened before then. Um, so, but it's a really nice, concise, good read if you're interested more extensively in, in the history uh, of drugs. But what, what was realized, and especially you know, with Reagan you know, being an actor and understanding the importance of everything. Oh, did I show you guys my picture? Oh, I, I just wanted to, talking about PR, this is like, I just wanted to share, make sure people saw. This has been, this is a, 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 China, a Chinese man smoking opium, holding his cat. This was the most popular postcard sent from California for 60 years. <laughs> we were defining an entire culture with this postcard. Um, excuse me? Cats, lead to drugs. Cats do lead to drugs. Um, and so, and so the, the understanding of a PR campaign and uh, what we wanted to do is where we kept going. So some of the things that we saw in the 80s, because Reagan has now, Nixon built the machine and Reagan has put on the parade. Everybody follow me, this is awesome. War on drugs, zero tolerance, drug free America. When in fact, as I'm, I hope so some of you, you should know, we don't even have drug-free prisons in this country. You know, we're talking about buildings with guards and fences and wires and all that great stuff, and you still can't keep that drug-free? So you think you're gonna keep Boston drug-free? Or Fall River? Or New Bedford? Um, there's a reality of the fact that substances are in our lives, they've been in our lives since the beginning of history, and we need to know how to deal with them, and we need to interact with them better. Um, so one of the, the, this is just a small encapsulation that I want to talk to you about a PR cam campaign to kind of show that it truly was a PR campaign. Um, are are you, any of you familiar with uh, the, the crack e epidemic of the 1980s and uh, the uh, scourge of the crack baby? Well, crack cocaine is a smokable form of, of cocaine. All crack is is cocaine with baking soda. That's it. So it's the same drug, but what happens is, once again, in a black market era where you're smuggling things because they're illegal, you can take your product cocaine, cut it with something cheap, expand the mass so you get more drug for your money, so you make more money. And, and then the fact of this is, because of the adding of the baking soda, people smoked crack because the way you ingest drugs depends on how quickly they affect you. Um, sniffing a drug uh, acts pretty quickly, taking a drug by your mouth acts pretty quickly, even quicker is smoking a drug, and then the quickest way to have the effects of a drug is injection. But so here we took crack cocaine, which is basically cocaine uh, and baking powder. We call it crack, we call it something, this brand new drug. Um, 
it's the scourge of neighborhoods and once again it's being focused on African Americans and poor communities um, that use this drug. And one of the big things that really kind of kicked off this um, epidemic was the um, unfortunate uh, passing of, do, do any of you guys ever heard of Len Baez? He was a University of Maryland basketball player who died of a crack overdose. And so, first of all, this happened at University of Maryland, which is right outside of DC. And by the way, Len Baez was the only, the Celtics that year had only one picked, and we picked Len, and then he died. So here we have this promising young man, this star, who overdosed from crack cocaine because it's this evil scourge. The black community is falling apart. Everything is horrible. We need to deal with crack. You then have women, crack addicts, having babies. And look at these poor crack babies. Um, uh, they are going to be so messed up that we need to follow them for the rest of their lives. Now, in reality, babies can have problems in birth and babies can come out unhealthy for a wide variety of reasons. What the PR campaign told us was that women were using crack and then their babies came out sickly, almost dying, and, and were going to have learning disabilities their whole life. What they didn't tell you is that a woman in throes of addiction is probably not just using crack. They're probably not taking prenatal vitamins. They're probably not eating right. They're probably drinking. And that, yes, there were babies that came out with, with problems, with health and physical health problems and some issues. But what we saw, and the big part of this with the crack baby, was in urban hospitals, they started identifying babies as, as crack babies. The babies were take, being taken away from the mother right away. So once again, leading to women, more women not going and getting medical help while pregnant because they're afraid that they were going to be incarcerated. But they were being labeled crack babies, and these children were being called crack babies through high school. What we learned about this was that the labeling of these young kids was the most the worst thing that happened to them. While yes, they might have been born premature, yes, they might have been born with some addiction issues, with the right medical care, they could be brought through that, they can come out and be healthy on the other end, and then be normal kids. But what we did was we decided, once again, the us and them, they were labeled crack babies, and that label actually followed them through school. And there's now been a couple of, uh, well, actually not anymore. In early, in, in mid-2000s, there were several reports, especially coming out of Baltimore and Chicago, and New York in uh, the Bronx. So once again, thinking about where were we going, we're just focusing on poor urban neighborhoods and people of color, saying that, that while yes, these kids might have been born with issues because of the crack use, that they actually physically and mentally became okay easily within a year. But that it was the stigma of being called a crack child for the rest of their learning career that caused more problems. They were put in special classes, they were uh, you know, identified publicly this way, and the one thing that I want to ask is, you know, have you guys recently, like even in the last 10 years, heard a lot about a crack baby or the crack epidemic and all the craziness that's going on? Not as much. And the fact is, is crack is still out there. It's still a drug people use. That PR campaign did its purpose and had its end. So even though there are still problems with people having issues with crack, and once again, actually now, the biggest issue that we're just doing is the sentencing. Because crack cocaine was made this big scourge. Now remember, once again, just cocaine with baking soda, that there was a 100 to 1 disparity in the sentencing. So if you got caught with a gram of cocaine, you would get um, one year, and this is just for easy math. If you were caught with a gram of crack, you would get 100 years in prison. The, the baking soda being the only thing that was added to that. But there was this disparity because of what class and race was using crack and what class and race was using cocaine. More wealthier people, more white people using cocaine, and poor people, people of color using crack. We just had, after decades of fighting, it wasn't until actually last year, the year before, that the disparity came down to one, it's now one to eight. So it's still not one to one. But it's one to eight, so if you got one year for, for cocaine, you would get eight years for the crack. But still, you know, that's ridiculous. We had um, similar disparities here in our sentencing in Massachusetts, um, but we uh, repealed those laws last year in hopes that we see the sentencing happening. But what, the reason that I wanted to talk about that was it was obvious, it, it, to me it is an obvious beginning and end of a PR campaign 
And it was, had nothing to do with the drug, the problems that drug was causing in society, the issues that families and people had with that drug. It was about the PR campaign. So one of the other things um, that I want to talk about is uh, what the drug war has done to civil liberties. Um, and uh, well, first, actually, let me talk a little bit about technology. Um, before 9-11 in the Department of Homeland Security and all this kind of tons of money into fighting terrorism, so we need to track you and we need all your data and we need to collect stuff going on, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, there was, the drug war was actually a reason for technology to expand. So it was during this period of times, like, you know, there's great leaps in, in how we could uh, do wiretapping. Bugs got really, really small. There was infrared lighting. They had these great gauges where you could measure the amount of heat being produced um, in, a, in a building to look if somebody had an indoor grow operation. We, had, we have drug enforcement coming out of black helicopters, rappelling down lines in full SWAT uniforms, dumping into, like, marijuana fields in California with two hippies sitting there with our hoe going, what? Um, and I, there's a lot of pictures, actually, if you go to the Dan Bomb book. Um, and also there's another book called uh, The Great Drug War that actually goes a lot into that kind of paramilitary that we have done in, in fighting the war on drugs. And this is not to say that, that there shouldn't be law enforcement, but it's just, to me, it's the theater that has been going on and the expansion all of all of this in the name of the war on drugs. Um, so what we saw was that civil liberties and our rights as individuals started taking more and more of a back seat in order to fight the good fight and fight the war on drugs. Um, a good example of this is what we saw happen with what is called our RICO statutes. Um, RICO statutes, is a, it's a, it was a, a federal law that was put into place to deal with racketeering, but basically what it was to deal with with organized crime families, because what would happen is I'm, I'm planning to commit a crime, so I'm going to call you and you're going to do a little piece of it, and then you're going to call her, and you're doing a little piece of it, you're going to call her and do a little piece of it. And so no one person had the entire crime kind of right there, so it would be hard to convict anybody. So the RICO statutes allowed there to be this expansion into called conspiracies. So you have a drug conspiracy, and then anybody involved with the conspiracy can not only be arrested, but they are going to be given the time as if they were the, the planner. So, so it's kind of like the driver of a car that goes to rob a bank, but he doesn't go in and he doesn't shoot anybody, but he's still part of that murder, right? Because he was there, he was part of the crime. But what happened with this, once again, was such an expansion and, and the lack of, of the civil rights part of it, which is you're supposed to look at each individual case, each individual crime, each individual person, and see what the situation is around them, and then figure out, A, are they guilty of something, and B, what should their punishment be? But what we did is we started creating boxes of sentencing guidelines where I don't care what the situation is, you're going to get five years because I do this on the top and I do this on the bottom, and that's the box you line in. It doesn't matter what any of the circumstances around that specific crime were. And the same thing with these conspiracy theories was that if you knew somebody that was dealing drugs or you talked to somebody or if you had somebody in your car that had you know, a bag of weed on them and it was caught, you would be liable and you would get arrested the same way. Um, but it really led to, it's led to a point of craziness and um, a, a personal story in this when in back in the, the 90s, kind of the real height of so much of this that was going on and there, the movement to, uh, calling for drug policy reform hadn't really risen yet and so we were kind of coasting on the, the Nixon and Reagan years and just getting, you know, more cops, more prisons, more people in jail, that's what we need, that will fix the problem. Um, uh, I was working in Washington, D.C., and my office just happened to get this call of a, a woman named Dorothy Gaines from federal prison. Um, she uh, was a nurse, mother of three, single mother. She had a boyfriend that uh, she realized pretty quick was not a good egg. I mean, he was, he was dealing drugs. He was involved with shady stuff. So she kicked him to the curb. Well, one day while she was at work, the boyfriend came into her house, you know, he used to just come there, went into the house and used the phone and did a drug deal and left the house. Well, what happens is the boyfriend gets caught and they're like, we're going to give you 20 years unless you have somebody to turn in. 
and, he, and he's not going to turn in a big boss because he doesn't know a big boss. So he, he turns in kind of a medium boss or a guy kind of at his same level that was dealing drugs with him. And, the, and then he goes, but that's the same. We need somebody else. So both of those men who were put in a cell together, by the way, so they colluded and, and talked about this, said, you know, the real person in this problem is this Dorothy Gaines person. Well, Dorothy Gaines being A, not involved, so B, having nobody to turn in, she didn't have anybody to rat out. She was sentenced to 24 years in prison, federal prison. When I started working with Dorothy, she had already spent uh, 10 years incarcerated for her phone being used by a drug dealer who was an ex-boyfriend. Um, it was just by luck of the draw, the day that she called my organization that I picked up the phone. It was luck of the draw that I, she and I connected and that I took it, got the bee in my bonnet and I found her pro bono counsel. We got um, a whole bunch of, of lawyers to sign on to a brief and actually one of the last acts that Clinton did before he left office was to release her from prison. But that was really, really lucky. Imagine how many Dorothy Gaines there are out there still sitting in prison. Yes? No, sir. A lifetime movie on that? On Dorothy? Like, I don't think so. I watched a movie and it's like that same situation. He went in the house and used the phone. She got time in prison. Right. Yeah. So what the question was, was Dorothy part of, Dorothy would have told me if she was Lifetime. She, <laughs> let me, no, Dorothy would have called me, gone, girl, what's going on? Yeah, so uh, we actually were still very close friends and while she was still incarcerated, I actually started uh, spending time with her family. She now lives, she, she's back in her home outside of Atlanta um, and her, her, actually her youngest now just started college. Um, but it does happen all the time. I'm glad Lifetime did something about it. Yeah. So it's, it, is, it is a story that is told. That is not Dorothy, but it, that is a story that happens all the time. Dorothy African American? Yes. So just Dorothy is a, a nurse, African, African American nurse. Um, you know, and, and with these mandatory minimums, the, the thing about Dorothy's story, so she, she was there on 24 years with several mandatory minimums piled on top of each other. So she couldn't even get off for good behavior. Dorothy, while incarcerated as a nurse, after he actually saved a prison guard who was having a heart attack, and she resuscitated the prison guard and brought them back and kept them going until medical prison guard survived. But you know what? You can't even, you know, with these mandatory minimums, you can save a prison guard's life and you don't even get any good time. They're like, oh, well, thanks. Have another good 12, 15 years. Um, so, so the reason that I tell that story is this machine that was, that was built about this and how these conspiracy laws, which started for a very specific person, purpose, kind of got really stretched out to kind of cover this other issue and cover these other types of crimes. So that leads me now to kind of the, uh, the second piece of the technology of what has happened is um, I'm sure, I don't know if you've all been paying attention to the fact that, uh, you know, after 9-11, we built the Department of Homeland Security and we said, you know, we need to fight ter terrorism. So millions and millions and millions of dollars have been put into yet another big, huge administrative structure and they're collecting data and they're going to figure out, you know, what the bad guys are doing next and, and, uh, but we're going to invest all this money and we're going to create new technology and we're going to create new ways of doing things. You know, we have unmanned drones, we have all these great things that you can do for the war on terrorism. But what we've actually found out recently that a lot of the data being collected and a lot of the um, powers that were created to stop terrorism are actually being used as weapons in the war on drugs. So, for example, I don't know if you all have read recently, we've had a couple of big bombs that have happened recently, such as the National Security Agency having access to all Verizon business customers uh, stuff. Uh, we, um, Verizon, Verizon business customers have been, Verizon has been giving the personal data information to the government for, uh, actually it was 40 weeks at last count. Yes? Uh, I think I remember shortly after 9-11, the uh, PR campaign had, uh, Using drugs supported terrorism. Yes. Which is kind of funny because Yeah, drugs are always a good, so, you know, drug, yeah, the drugs supporting terrorism and actually to skip a little bit, I don't know if, uh, well, I'll get to that in, in, in a little more modern sense. But what we were seeing is this technology and this data collection being used to save us from terrorism. Well, what we have just learned, another bomb that was just released, and I'm sorry, that's the wrong phrase to use. 
Another uh, piece of information that we just learned out of Freedom of Information uh, Act request, which is how the ACLU does a lot of its work, because believe me, the government does not share information, even though it's supposed to be public. Uh, and we often, what we do is we do a request, they don't send it to us, so then we sue them. We get the information and then it's like a piece of paper, you know, that wonderful black marker redacted. It's like, oh, I can see a date, and oh, I think that's the word the. Everything else is redacted. Um, but we did find out that um, the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security have been feeding data and information about people to the DEA and local law enforcement to fight the war on drugs. Now, one would say, well, this is great because these law enforcement agencies are working together. The problem is, is all this information was gathered without warrants and without people knowing and without any oversight by the courts, which is the whole point of our system, checks and balances. And so what we also found in our most recent FOIA, that not only were they sharing all this data to fight the war on drugs, but they actually have a policy manual about how to lie to district attorneys and judges on the origin of how you got this information. Because it's called fruit of a poison tree. So if you find information about a crime but you didn't get a warrant for it or you, or you got that information illegally, it can't be used at trial. So all of this information, because it was data sharing from Department of Homeland Security to the DEA, was going to all be po fruit from a poison tree. So what they did was they actually created a policy manual and trained law enforcement DEA agents how to lie and how to cover the origins of how this information was gathered so that it could then be used to prosecute drug crimes. You say the danger in that is there, there could be real criminals but then now set free. Exactly. So just so you know, the comment was, it's not that, uh, that we're talking about there are bad people in the world doing bad things. There are a reason why we have police officers in courts and prisons. Um, but what was just mentioned, which is totally true, if you use this tainted information, somebody that is illegal can be let go because the rules have been broken, thus creating an entire policy on how to lie, um, which just is frightening right there because we're now training government agents how to get around the rules established by our government. Um, so. You know, where are we today, especially on this issue of race and civil liberties and what's going on? Well, one of the things that has happened is the government, as I said before, it's a lot of it's a PR campaign. As I said, you know, they got much better at their words. It's not a czar anymore. When you listen to people talk about our national drug control policy, people will talk about treatment instead of incarceration and that we need to help people. But if you look at the budgets, Budgets for law enforcement, budget, budgets for toys, budgets for surveillance keep going up. And actually, budgets for treatment, for mental health services and everything is going down. So they're talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. I mean, we keep funding it as a war, and we're calling it something else. Um, and so what we've seen, especially with the fact that, that Congress moves as slow as it does, and we've all seen the kind of the problems that we've been facing um, and very polarized issues in Congress, we've seen a lot of reforms start going to the state level. Yes? Is this the same thing as when the beginning of the year there was a college student that took Molly as the form of ecstasy? Yeah, Molly, Molly, yeah. Is a, Molly is a form of ecstasy, yes. So what's in Wally to be called Wally instead of ecstasy? If they, um, um, just, just a little bit. So MDMA is ecstasy, and it's actually a chemical that was uh, created by a, a scientist here in America named Sasha Shulgin. Uh, but uh, Molly, from what I know, and I have not done extensive research on it yet, but from my gather, it, there's just another little added chemical to, to, to it. And, and actually, it's more of a takeaway because one of the things that has been happening just on this tangent with Molly overdoses is that people have been taking a, a m much more Molly than they normally would ecstasy. And one of the things that has changed in the chemical compound of Molly versus ecstasy is ecstasy does have a little bit of methamphetamine in it. So you get that high, and you know you're high, and you're running around and you're high. With the molly, they've taken out the, the methamphetamine aspect, and people take the drug and they're like, I don't think this is working. And they take more because they're expecting an ecstasy high and not a molly high. So I'm not sure of the exact chemical compound of what has happened, but that's the overall basis just so you know on the molly thing. Once again, it's not a new drug. 
it's an old drug that is have that that's been around, but it's kind of a good. We always have there's the you know when when meth and when crystal meth came out a couple of years ago, the new drug crystal meth. No, it was called crank in the 70s. It's been around for forever. It's just a new way of talking about this drug and getting people scared about it in a new generation. Same way there was the epidemic with the crystal meth that the same sex matters people were using. That was the new stereotype. Yes, there's definitely been as well, not only racial stereotypes, but, but um, sexual orientation uh, uh, stereotypes with drugs as well. So yes, there's definitely part of the them, this is them versus us, because when they, they say who that is. Um, but going back to state laws today, they are changing rapidly. Um, but a lot of times, unfortunately, you know, I would like to say it's because we've all figured out that this drug war has failed and we need to be better and think about people's health and think about our communities and think about safety and getting people to be productive members of the society versus just locking them up and then waiting for them to come out and not be able to get a job because they have a criminal record and they're probably more addicted to drugs because they could easily use drugs in prison and uh, they're coming out again and then they recidivate. I wish it was for that reason, but we've had a bunch of major changes on the state level because of money. Michigan and Mississippi, um, two years ago, both uh, released all of their low-level nonviolent drug offenders. Not because they thought maybe these people would do better with treatment than incarceration, it was because they, the state couldn't afford to feed and house them anymore in their overcrowded prisons. Uh, something similar just happening in uh, California. Um, and another thing that, that we've been seeing happening is at least the recognition of these problems at a governmental level where they want to study things. Now, I don't know. I've, I personally think that, that we know that a lot of our drug war policies are, are race-based and, and have racial issues and an us and them policy, as I've been talking about for an hour and a half. But we need to collect data because this is the government. So one of the things that we have been seeing is more and more discussions of collecting data, especially around policing. Um, a big story that has just come up recently, and, and we're, we're about a year and a half behind this here in Massachusetts, but in New York, um, they have a policy on Terry stops. Terry stops um, um, actually comes out of a Supreme Court case, Terry versus somebody. Um, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Terry versus somebody. Um, but the main point is that police do have, with just a probable cause, they are able to stop somebody and kind of pat them down because they think they might be committing a crime. So they're called Terry stops or stop and frisks. What was happening in New York is they had this, this Terry stop policy and they started doing data collection. And what they found out was who was getting stopped by police and frisks? Black and Latinos, right? Eight times out of 10, it was a black and Latino. And it was like, well, why is it black and Latino? Well, where are they choosing to police? Poor urban areas. You know, they're not going to touch me standing on Fifth Avenue in front of Saks. They're not going to come pat me down. But you know, you're sitting somewhere in the Bronx and you're just walking down the street and you're a person of color. That might happen. Um, so they found out that this policy was actually racially biased. And they brought it to a court. And the federal court said, we're looking at all the data. We're looking at the data. We're looking at the practices. And we're not saying that the New York Police Department sat down and said, we're going to write a racist policy. But the end outcome is it's a racist policy. Um, Mayor Bloomberg in New York City and all these people were outraged. And here, this is something else, a four-page New York Times article because the judge said, no, you guys are racist. You can't do this policy anymore. <coughs> um, what was amazing to me, um, I don't, do you guys uh, know the actor Cal Penn? He was in the Har Harold and Kumar movies, and then he's done some guest spots on things. Well, for a while, he was an advisor in the White House about young people, about youth. And so I think he sees himself as kind of a Politico guy. So right after Bloomberg came out and said, this, this is ridiculous, this policy is not racist, it's, we're just going after the bad people, Cal Penn decided to send out a tweet, the guys probably will regret this this end day, saying, I don't know why everybody's so upset, they're just arresting the people that are doing the crime. And what they were finding with all these stops and frisks is just personal possession of small amounts of mostly marijuana. So basically it's sitting there going, so only people of color use drugs in New York. I didn't know that. Awesome. I mean, who knew? Um, so he was actually hugely attacked, and this whole policy is going back and forth. We have a federal judge coming in and saying, it's not working. We need to change these practices. And a lot of this also has to do 
once again, the propaganda of the world that police officers have to live in now. It is a culture in the police departments. It is a culture for young officers coming in. Now, just so everybody knows, somebody that runs toward danger, I will salute every single day. That is amazing to me, somebody that runs into, into danger. But we have a culture now in our law enforcement of how many of stats, how many stop, you know, how many arrests did you have? Not were people safe in your beat today? How many arrests did you have? Um, a culture of, of racism that, that per permeates in many, many police departments. Um, just the way that they are, the, who, who actually are our police officers? Um, Here's an uh, article, uh, just when Ed Davis announced, who's the police commissioner of Boston, announced that he's leaving. <coughs> There's a big debate now going on because of, uh, under his leadership, Latino and black police officers um, as a whole were not promoted up to uh, ranks of supervisory positions or, or higher positions. Um, so there's a culture there that way. So I'm not saying police are bad. What I'm saying is that we have built a culture by calling a war on a group of people. We have set up adversaries. We have set this up. We have created the problem that we're sitting in right now. And um, uh, just to, to kind of end on, well, I have a few more minutes. No questions. I can't believe I'm this good. Oh, yes, yay, question. Yes. The, uh, back around the time of the 26th Amendment, when the voting age was dropped to uh, 18, yeah. uh, states, I know Massachusetts was one, dropped the drinking age to 18. I, I wonder how long that happened and what happened. Well, I think once again, what has happened is as, as we're, we're in a, I, I think very honestly, and this is now kind of Whitney riffing on this just because I've studied it for so long, I think we're, we're a, a country of denial a lot of the times. We want the easy fix. We want the silver bullet. If we're having problems with young people drinking, let's just raise the age and we'll think that a crime will deter them. The deterrence theory, which is a theory that if you make the punishment so bad, people will commit the crime, does not work. If the death penalty for murder did not deter people from murdering people, I mean, you can't get any more hardcore than that crime. But we, for so long, thought, believed in this kind of deterrence theory. So what we'll do is we'll make it a crime for younger people to use drugs so we'll be able to control that population of young people because we're scared of them. You know, we, don't have, we didn't at that time have a war to send them to, right? We had all these young people there doing things, so let's make it 21. And I don't know if I said it in this class or my last one, you know, as I said, this whole age thing is so arbitrary. You know, 18, you know, you can, as you said, you know, going to war, I think that's a good, you know, if you're going to send somebody to war at 18, let's let them drink. Let's let, if they're going to vote and create our nation, they should also be, you know, able to do that. Um, but we recently just had in, in, in Boston, and, and so, you know, it, it's there every day. One of our mayoral candidates in Boston, and I don't know if you guys read, we have 12 of them, and I voted this morning because I live in Boston. Um, but one of our candidates actually came out and said, what we need to do is revamp the entire Boston Police Department and take a, and, uh, and, and run it the way New York does. <laughs> and the, like, you know, Twitter, the blogosphere, all the newspapers, everybody in Boston was like, what are you talking about? There was just a federal case. There's all these things going on saying that the policies were racist and not working and doing all this stuff. Why are you going to a policy you know doesn't work? Because a lot of times politicians, when reapplying for their jobs or applying for their new job, because remember, that's something else that we have in this country. Like, I'm glad we have a democracy, but we've created a situation when somebody has to reapply for their job every two years, they're spending a whole time of their, when they're supposed to be working, worrying about the next election, or two to four years, depending on the, the office. Um, so where we are, what we're seeing happening today in drug policy is the surveillance state that we've been, been kind of been growing is being used to continue to fight the war on drugs. Um, what we are seeing is a continued focus on criminal justice punishment, us versus them, that is going on. And you know, we're seeing that we now have in the United States over two million people incarcerated. And a uh, very low estimate is that over 45% um, of those people there are for simple drug crimes. But if you actually even, you know, and then if you get to like small sales, you add another, but a large portion of our, our, our prison population is full of people there because of the drug war and because of drug crimes. And we are now, as a nation, incarcerating more people than all of Europe combined. 
We are a nation that is incarcerating more people than under the, under the gulag in Russia. So here we are, land of the free, home of the brave, and deciding that we're going to, to take whole entire groups of people, identify them, and how, what do we do? We get rid of them, we incarcerate them, then we lock them up. So I do believe, and the whole point of this is that, that, the, the, that we do need policies and we do need ways to deal with drugs in society. Um, because you don't want to hurt others, and you know we hope to, to educate well, but the real thing to do is to focus on education and to focus on the reality of the situation. Look what we did in this country with smoking. We didn't start throwing people that smoke cigarettes in jail. We didn't start arresting them and giving them records. What did we do? We had honest campaigns. Guess what? You smoke this stuff for a long time, you're gonna die. Not always, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be splintistic, but they did an, an, an educational campaign to help, make, help people make healthier choices. Um, and so you know, my, the overall theme of where I'm coming to is, is recognize what our war on drugs is. It's about control. It's a, it's, it's a lot about race. It's about controlling populations and cr controlling the them versus us. The drugs just happen to be some, that the, what, the, what we're using as the excuse, but we certainly haven't moved any closer to a drug-free America or for being smarter about drugs because we continue to lie to our children in education. When you look at a class of young people and you say, you know, if you smoke marijuana, you'll probably take the next step to cocaine or heroin. And then you have that kid going, wait a minute, my older brother, my mom, my cousin, they've all tried marijuana. They're not heroin addicts. This teacher's lying to me. So why would kids be believing on anything else? Because scare tactics don't work. And I, I really, and where we come from the ACLU is we need to recognize that this war is about something else and that we need to deal with, with racism and racial issues and institutionalized racism that does exist in this country. And then we need to deal with drugs. But the fact that we've, we've put here and said the scourge of the war on drugs is because of all these horrible people is just not the truth. It's not working and we are far worse off than we would have been going down a different road and dealing with illicit drug policy. Um, so it's kind of a good stopping point. I hear people shuffling papers because they got to go. Um, any final questions or anything? Yeah. I was going to say a larger part of it is the power of profit structure. Yes. And I'm sorry, just the last thing, it's money. <laughs> Money's always a big thing in everybody. Thanks, everybody. If you have questions, I think ACLUM.org is the ACLU of Massachusetts. Feel free to go there and ask any questions.